Hi everyone, welcome back to Clutch Situation. Today on the channel we're going to be talking about the science and engineering of pencil lead. And the reason why I decided to do this video is because whenever I'm not being an enthusiast with mechanical pencils, I'm a science teacher and I'm very interested in general science of the world, of course, but also the engineering of how that science comes to light in terms of helping people out. And so I thought that uh, despite the fact that I collect mechanical pencils, I'm also very much interested in the fact that a mechanical pencil's entire function is to hold on to the little bit of a substance that is going to be marking your paper. In other words, the pencil lead. That's the whole purpose of a mechanical pencil. And so what is the characteristic of that lead? Well, first thing that we have to understand scientifically is that lead isn't actually the element lead. Pencil lead was originally called lead because just like lead is a metal that can be easily scraped off and, and smudge your fingers, there is a crystalline structure of carbon that can do the same thing. And that crystalline structure of carbon is called graphite. Most pencil leads in modern times are composed of a combination of two materials, graphite, this crystalline structure of the element carbon, and clay, which is a variety of different pieces of rocks that have been ground down, weathered into very, very fine particles, mostly made of uh, various oxides, aluminum oxide, silica oxide. And so when we're talking about pencil lead, it's not actually lead. It gets the name lead from the fact that just like lead can smudge your fingers, the metal, uh, this crystalline structure of carbon graphite can do the same thing. And so if we think about the periodic table of the elements, carbon is a non-metal. It's located on the non-metal side of the periodic table. And lead is a transition metal. It's located in that big section in the middle of it. Uh, with metals that have multiple bonding properties. Carbon is the basis of life, and it works very well as the basis for life because it can make four molecular bonds. If you've ever followed science fiction and heard of uh, a reference to uh, silicon-based organisms, that's a reference to the fact that silicon, which is right below carbon on the periodic table, can also make four bonds. Now, when you get elements that can make multiple bonds, it introduces all sorts of interesting aspects of those elements that we keep track of from a chemical standpoint, and keeping track of those aspects of carbon is really useful to understand what graphite is doing as a crystalline structure molecule when we're writing with it. And so a couple of facts about graphite. Well, I'd like to point out that the first graphite deposit was discovered in England around 1565. People had like been scratching rocks or writing using biological inks on papyrus or carving things into stone to record things. And graphite was a mineral that was discovered in England that people discovered, hey, if I rub graphite on things, it leaves a mark too. This could be used in applications for writing. And so what's going on with graphite? So graphite is the version of carbon. Graphite is not diamond, quite different. Okay, so they're similar in that both graphite and diamond are made entirely of carbon atoms. The difference is, is that graphite is just in a different crystalline structure than diamond is. Diamond has a much stronger crystalline structure than graphite does. And if we take a look at the crystalline structure of graphite, it's this hexagonal honeycomb lattice structure. And I drew this before the video here so you could sort of see what's going on. And there's a lot of really interesting things about this lattice structure. Well, I should say one primary thing that is really uh, important about this, and that is how these uh, lattices are organized in layers. And a single layer is called graphene. And then those layers are connected to each other by weaker bonds. They're called van der Waals bonds. And these bonds are different from the classic bonds that you may have heard uh, learned about in a chemistry class in school, like covalent bonds or ionic bonds. In like, unlike those other two types of bonds, van der Waals bonds are much weaker attractions. Uh, and it's likely due to something that is going on at the quantum level, and that's going to be beyond the scope of this, this video. But like um, hydrogen bonding, which can occur uh, for water molecules, which uh, helps with uh, create uh, property of surface tension 
and capillary reaction with water molecules, Van der Waals bonds are another weak bond that can occur between layers of this graphene. Now, the graphene itself is composed of these hexagons of carbon atoms that I've denoted with these little dots here, connected by stronger covalent bonds. And if you remember from basic chemistry, covalent bonds happen when the outer parts of atoms share electrons with them. And that sharing is a much stronger bond than ionic bonds. In ionic, bond, in ionic bonds, uh, electrons actually are moving from different parts of the outer layers of atoms to other parts, and that creates a charge difference between atoms, uh, which are now called ions, and then there's an electrostatic att attraction between those atoms that have a charge difference. So we have covalent bonds here in graphite, and each layer is called graphene, and if you're wondering why the heck should I care about this, it's because this, these layers of graphene are what are being scraped apart when you write with a pencil. And so these weaker van der Waals bonds are being broken and graphene is essentially being grafted onto the paper from your pencil, whatever writing utensil you're using. And so there's some uh, interesting organizational physical chemistry uh, for graphite. And so continuing with some basics of how graphite works, we can rate it on the Mohs hardness scale. And on the Mohs hardness scale, an example on the Mohs hardness scale, diamond would be 10 on the Mohs uh, hardness scale. And then a much softer uh, mineral that can be rated on the scale would be talc. And so on the Mohs hardness scale, we have a one to two, which is actually very similar to talc, and talc is gonna come back into this in a little bit, because talc is essentially a form of a clay, and that's gonna be important when we talk about how mechanical pencil leads are engineered here in a second. It has a metallic luster. Luster means, is it shiny? And uh, also related to that metallic luster is the fact that well, not related to the metallic luster. It, it may invoke this if you think about metallic luster. Um, graphite is slightly conductive. And so it's useful in a wide variety of applications besides pencil lead, uh, since it will uh, very weakly conduct electricity. Uh, if we compare silicon, which is just below carbon on the periodic table, silicon is also a semiconductor in various forms, and that's why you have uh, silicon being a primary element that is used in the manufacture of computer microprocessors, because sometimes you don't want to conduct electricity too much. When you do, that's what melts your circuits. And so silicon as a semiconductor is really useful in that regard. Uh, that was a little aside, my apologies for that. Now we get to some critical parts of how the chemical nature of graphite leads to uh, mechanical pencils and pencil lead and marking. So we can also talk about the cleavage of graphite, and no, not that cleavage. The cleavage in a geologic sense, in a physical chemistry sense, means the ability of an object to break along a plane. And... Graphite breaks very easily along planes due to those van der Waals bonds that I talked about a little bit ago. Um, graphite also has a greasy feel. So if we were to use pure graphite in pencils, it would be a bit of a problem for several reasons. The biggest one being that it would rub away really easily. Okay, because graphite naturally, due to those weaker bonds, cleaves along those planes of that honeycomb lattice structure. And it would also have a greasy feel. We get it very easily all over our fingers. It isn't ideal. And so what happened is that there's uh, people who are working on this problem of pencil lead and trying to figure out how to deal with the fact that graphite is greasy and it was cleaving too much, essentially, along those planes. And so what sort of happened here? Well, there was a very famous Czech, well, now famous, I should say, Czech manufacturer of pencils called Koinor, and they patented it, patented sorry about that, patented a graphite clay combo in 1802. Okay, big deal. So what? Why is that important? Well, when you combine graphite and clay together, 
the benefit of that combination is that the clay is making that mixture stronger, so it is less likely to cleave before you want it to. And the graphite is providing the marking that you're trying to get out of the lead. And so what's the deal with clay? What is clay? Okay, and so you're used to thinking about clay perhaps in an art sense. Um, and But basically what clay is at its, at its most basic level is very fine particles of weathered rock. Clay can exist naturally as a mineral within igneous and metamorphic rocks as they form. It can exist as a part of weathering array of graphite that was, um, or I'm sorry, weathering array of other minerals that uh, is present in um, sedimentary rocks as well. It can be in any of the types of rock, basically, or can be, uh, I don't want to use the word born because it's not alive, can be formed from the weathering of different types of rocks that are weathered away. And it can be made of a wide variety of elements, the most common being silicon and aluminum and magnesium, sometimes even iron. And clay, its useful property is that it's plastic in nature. It can be molded. And the reason why it is plastic and can be molded is because by its very nature it is a hydrous molecule. Okay? And that means that it's associated with bonding with water. Now, it's important to note, I think, here that talc is a form of clay. And when people think of really soft minerals like talc that are like a one on the Mohs hardness scale, we're talking about a mineral that is essentially a clay mineral. And so perhaps it shouldn't surprise us that graphite also has a very low number on the Mohs hardness scale. If you are interested in chemical formulas, this is just one of them. This is kaolinite. It's oftentimes difficult to pronounce. And the molecular formula for that is silicon dioxide, which is essentially sand, okay, and aluminum oxide bonded to two molecules of water. Okay, So there's that water that comes in that's giving it its hydrous properties. And these are all minerals that would be present in whatever rock was weathered away that produce the clay. So... What's going on with modern pencil lead? What happens here? Well, here's what happens. If you want to make modern pencil lead, you take a giant drum. Here's my drum. And you're going to throw whatever combination of clay and graphite ground up into that drum. And you're also going to throw some water into that drum as well. And you're going to spin the drum and spin it and spin it and spin it and spin it and try to get these things really well blended together. At this stage, it, it is a physical combination. It is not a chemical reaction. You are just mixing the graphite and the clay together. But as you're mixing and as you're adding water and mixing and mixing and mixing, the next step is what we could call the toothpaste step or we could call it the pasta step. No matter what analogy helps you to think about it, you're going to be extruding that mixture through a smaller space. When you're squeezing a tube of toothpaste, you're squeezing a substance through a smaller tube in order to shape it. Same thing happens in the formation of pasta. And so this mixture that was mixed together in the drum is getting squeezed or extruded, extruded through whatever size hole they're going to extrude it through in order to get the size of the lead that they actually want. And after you extrude it, you dry it out to a certain specification, and then it is baked at a temperature of around 1800 degrees Fahrenheit, and that baking helps to cure it and remove any of the additional water that is not needed to, to make it a, a tougher lead. And uh, that's the basic process of making a pencil lead. And depending upon how much clay and how much graphite you throw into the mix, that's going to influence the characteristic of your pencil lead. And so to sort of test that out, I have two pencils here. 
both Artist Loft pencils, 1 in 8B and 4H. And I've talked in my mechanical pencil lead test video before about the difference between these different grades. Uh, basically, an 8B pencil, pick that one up first. So here's our 8B, is going to have a greater proportion of graphite in the mixture. Okay, and the benefit, benefit of that is that you are going to have an easier time marking because that graphite will come off onto the paper quite easily. If we compare that to a 4H pencil, and you can already sort of see the difference here on the video, there is a lower proportion of graphite. In other words, a greater proportion of clay. And so you have a harder time marking, but sometimes that's what you want. Sometimes if you're an artist or whatever application you're using, you want to be able to not have as much marks on the paper if you're sketching. And so these pencils run from 10B all the way up to 10H is the latest information I was able to gather, and it's all about this proportion of graphite and clay that they are engineering into the core of this pencil. And so that's the basics of it. That's the science and engineering of pencil lead. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments. Um, I'm not a physical chemistry expert per se. I'm not a, I'm not a university person. I'm not a researcher. I, I mean, I know a lot about chemistry as a result of, of being a science teacher, um, but I'm sure there's some aspect of this video that I uh, could have provided more detail on. Okay, I understand that. I understand that there's far more to this. I'm just trying to give people the basics understanding of what the science and engineering is of pencil lead. And so if there's more that you think watchers of the channel should know about the science and engineering of, of pencil lead, feel free to leave that below in the comments uh, and I'm going to keep plugging away at videos that we can share our hobby with each other and ask questions and think about interesting things of the history and the science and the engineering of a device for me that sole purpose is essentially to grip a piece of graphite and clay that has been mixed together with water, dried out, baked into a proportion that will give us an amount of marking that we are happy with. And so that's everything that goes into pencil lead. And so I hope you enjoyed, have a great day, and I'll talk to you later.